The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to the latest in a series of webinars being organized under the long-term energy scenarios for the clean energy transition campaign. So I think most of you are aware of this, but this is a campaign being organized under the Clean Energy Ministerial, led by Germany and Denmark, uh, but organized and supported by IRENA. And the purpose of this campaign is to promote the wider adoption and improved use of long-term energy scenarios to guide the energy transition towards clean energy. So we're trying to hold these uh, webinars pretty frequently and uh, invited speakers from across the campaign. Today we've got uh, two sets of speakers um, to talk to you about their experience of long-term energy scenarios and what they're working on, what they've learned. So let me introduce, introduce them. So from the International Energy Agency, we have Dr. Uwe Reme um, and Dr. Stephanie Bouquet. So they'll be talking to us in just a moment about their work. And when they're done, we will turn to colleagues in Chile. So Javier Bustos, who's head of the Foresight Unit in the Chilean Ministry of Energy, and Juan Carlos Araneda, who's a transmission planning manager in the independent service operator in Chile, the coordinator, forgive me, I'm going to mispronounce this, coordinator electrico nacional. Now, each uh, set of speakers has about 20 minutes in total, so 15 minutes or so for presentation, and then five minutes for questions afterwards. We're gonna try and keep this webinar to a maximum of an hour overall. So I'm very grateful that the speakers can sit, stick to their time slots. A few practicalities uh, for you to be aware of. So um, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, and will be posted on the long-term energy scenarios uh, part of our webpage. All of you on the line, apart from the presenters, are muted, so I'm afraid you can't talk to us, um, but if you want to communicate with us, then please use the questions uh, section in the webinar interface. Hopefully you'll spot that there. You can post questions. They'll be sent to us, the organizers, and we can review them. They won't be sent to everybody. And we'd encourage you to ask questions throughout uh, the presentations, because at the end of the presentations, I'll be looking through them and trying to pick out a few. My apologies in advance. Clearly, we can't get through everything that people might ask. But I'll try and pick a representative sample, and we'll also keep a record of the other questions asked, and maybe we can follow up on them separately. If you have any technical difficulties, um, then I think the, f the best thing to, to try is to disconnect and reconnect again, or you can try dialing in via phone, and you'll find the phone number in the original email that you received, or it's available on the screen in the webinar interface. You can also download the slides from the handouts section, again, in the webinar interface. If you have any problems with that, do message us, and we'll see what we can do. Generally, any issues, maybe post it as a question through the questions interface, and we'll see if we can assist. So I hope that's all clear. Any problems, send us a message. Otherwise, I'm going to hand over now um, to Uwe and Stephanie, and they'll take you through their presentation from the International Energy Agency. Uwe and Stephanie. Thanks, Paul, for the introduction. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so <clears throat> with this question of how do we use all the scenarios, um, with all the publications we have here at the IA, we try to answer mostly uh, three types of questions. So the first is, where are we today? So data collection within the IA is really an important part of our work. And uh, having a good quality of data uh, enables us already to have good grounds for scenarios and projections. So that's uh, already an important part of our work. Um, we have also this uh, tracking clean energy progress that uh, you can find on our website, where we look at already near-term trends and uh, to understand what is uh, the current situations uh, for the deployment and uh, development of low carbon technologies. And with this analysis, we, we can check um, how the current uh, deployment and development of these technologies uh, match or not uh, with 
what will be required uh, by 2025 in a two degree scenario. This is also complemented uh, by the work that is done for the World Energy Investment Report, where we uh, track all the investments uh, that are currently done within the energy sector. So that's already the first part of, uh, of our work. And with all this data, we can already set up the scene. And <clears throat> we have two then uh, key other publications that look at long-term scenarios, which are ETP, uh, the Energy Technology Perspective, and the World Energy Outlook. And with these, we try to answer the second kind of bucket of questions, which is where are we going and where do we need to go? So with uh, our scenarios, we try to look at uh, the global energy system. And uh, these two publications are based on different approaches. We try to um, implement or look at the implementation of uh, what are the current policies and a cautious implementation of uh, policies that have been announced. And we try to answer the question on where are we going? Where are we going with all these policies? And with additional scenarios that we develop uh, within the IA, such as the sustainable development scenario or the 2 d scenario, we try to answer the question where do we need to go and what is the gap, in fact, between uh, those uh, different type of scenarios between our current trajectory and what could be a sustainable pathway. But of course, uh, some of these pathways need a faster and bigger deployment of uh, some key technologies. So that's why uh, we have also other uh, publications that are the technology roadmaps, uh, which try to identify strategies to um, address what could be uh, the barriers that need to be overcome to have a faster deployment of those technologies that are required in a 2DS world or a sustainable development world. Uh, we work also closely um, uh, with the 6,000 researchers from academia, uh, research centers, governments, and industry through the technology collaboration program. And uh, one of this uh, program is uh, the EDSAP. Uh, it's a program uh, that is uh, ongoing on energy modeling. So uh, as a whole, scenarios and analysis uh, within the IE are used in different ways, uh, in long-term outlooks, but also in, ro in roadmaps to inform all our stakeholders that are member uh, governments and industries. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, before uh, getting into the, the, the IE long-term models, uh, we'll just give you an overview of uh, the different uh, approach and the different time frame uh, we have within the IEA. So uh, the first uh, modeling analysis that we have is uh, all the market uh, reports that we have for energy efficiency, coal, gas, uh, and also renewables. Those analyses are uh, for the near-term trends. So we look at uh, what uh, could happen in the next five years. Those are forecasts. Then uh, we have more the market and policy-based scenarios, uh, which is uh, the world energy outlook. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have also the energy technology perspective that are focused uh, a bit more on uh, technology. <clears throat> we have also additional uh, analysis uh, that uh, look now at uh, system integration. So we have a new unit within the IA since uh, two years now that looks at uh, all the uh, issues of flexibility uh, on the power system. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> the people may ask why we have two uh, different models within the IA to look at the long-term um, issues. So we have one, uh, which is uh, the world energy model developed for the world energy publication, and we have uh, the energy technology perspective model. So we have two models, but two models to answer different questions, but that rely on uh, similar drivers. So we use the same drivers, uh, for example, as the cement production, the floor area, the ownership of air conditioner, of cars, and so on, and GDP. Uh, so those drivers uh, are similar for the two uh, models, but those two models try to answer different questions. One, um, the ETP model, which will look more at the technology angle, the technology aspects, and the one that looks more at uh, the policy uh, approach and try to give uh, more uh, insights 
on um, uh, the what is working in terms of policies, while uh, the ATP model will enable us to have better insights on the technology aspects and uh, to guide us uh, on the, the needed for additional roadmaps on these technologies. So, next slide, please. Thanks. <clears throat> um, in terms of use of our scenarios, uh, Within the IA, we have also uh, an important uh, area of work uh, related to sustainable development goals uh, with uh, these scenarios. Uh, so, for example, the, um, the World Energy Outlook uh, has been collected annual data since 2002 on the progress done um, within each country regarding its access on electricity and on clean cooking. So, to track how many people have access to electricity, uh, with grid connections, on grid, uh, off grid, mini grid, but also on the clean cooking aspect, on uh, how many people uh, rely today on solid fuels uh, used in a traditional way, and that could lead to important health hazards. So uh, we have also developed dedicated reports or even uh, chapters uh, within the world in Energy Outlook to look at these issues and to inform uh, policymakers on uh, the, the importance of these issues and the importance of tackling these issues in terms of uh, um, economic growth, uh, but also in terms of uh, health uh, impact. The uh, IA is also tracking progress uh, for other uh, sustainable development goals uh, linked to uh, renewables, but also to uh, energy efficiency. And uh, we are co-leading also uh, the Global Tracking Framework Report uh, with uh, other um, international agencies such as ARENA, World Bank, uh, WHO, and UN. Um, since last year, so I, I have mentioned it uh, a few times already, uh, in, within the World Energy Outlook, we have developed and presented a new scenario, which is the Sustainable Development Scenario, and which aims at uh, achieving the different goals, not only climate change, but also uh, energy access and air pollution. So to make sure that uh, it's an integrated scenario that uh, look at uh, different issues at the same time. So next slide, please. Uh, just a few information on the, the, the roadmap that I've mentioned earlier. Um, we have developed this roadmap uh, over the last uh, nine years now. Uh, there are around more than 20 roadmaps that have been developed and that looked at uh, different uh, aspects and uh, technologies uh, within the energy mix. So looking at the smart grids, looking at bioenergy, uh, all of these uh, could be found uh, on our website and all of these are there to inform policymakers on uh, the barriers that need to be overcome to develop uh, faster uh, these technologies. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. So now I'm taking over the presentation. Um, yes, as Stephanie already mentioned, we use the scenarios um, also to benchmark um, the current progress uh, in the deployment and improvement of clean technologies um, against uh, whether we reach our sustainability goals um, in, the, in the sustainable development scenario. And uh, we, we do that by, by extrapolating the current trend that we see for technologies, for example, in the deployment of solar PV against the deployment level that we see in 2030 in our sustainable development scenarios. So in that way, we assess whether we are on track in reaching our um, in the deployment of clean technologies um, or not. And what you see here on the slide on the graph is the um, assessment using using traffic the traffic lights. And the sombering news from this year's edition of tracking clean energy progress is. Um, that we are only on track uh, or with, on, with four technologies, namely that um, solar PV, um, lighting in buildings, um, electric vehicles in the transport sector, and also in the service sector, the energy use for, for data centers and networks. Uh, while for 23 uh, technologies, we think that uh, the technologies are moving in the right direction, but we need more improvements or improvements have to happen faster. 
And for 11 uh, technologies, for example, CCS, we think that we are currently not on track at all, so that even much more efforts are there needed to, for these technologies to unlock their potential. Moving to the next slide, um, I just want to talk a bit about uh, some of the kind of current ongoing work in how we try to improve or further develop our scenarios and our modeling work. Um, one challenge from long-term models is often the representation of the electricity system or the system in general at a higher temporal resolution, particularly to reflect variability in electricity demand, but also variability in generation, particularly if we think about the integration of very renewables in the electricity system. In principle, it's possible to increase the temporal resolution in, in long-term models, um, but often it also then leads to excessively large computational, large models and then large computational time. So there's also limits how far one can increase, let's say, uh, the, the size or the resolution in these long-term models. And what you see here is an alternative approach that we have been developing over the last years. So it's linking the long-term models to dedicated production cost models um, or tools to assess the flexibility and stability of the power system at even finer resolution, for example, on, on the scale of minutes. And um, for the flexibility analysis, the production cost model takes on um, the capacity mix from the long-term model as input and analyzes the electricity system on its time scale of minutes or hours to, uh, to understand whether the, or to assess whether the capacity mix from the long-term model is feasible when taking also into account these flexibility constraints. And just to give you one example, our colleagues in our system integration unit work, for example, together with the Electricity Generation Authority of Thailand to assess uh, with the Plexus, to develop a Plexus model for Thailand to assess the different flexibility options for increasing very renewable, very, very renewable shares in Thailand's electricity system. Um, on the next slide, you um, see um, um, related to the competitiveness of uh, power technologies, a new indicator that we introduced um, this year, or new metric that we introduced this year in the World Energy Outlook, is a so-called value-adjusted um, levelized cost of electricity. And um, the motivation has been uh, for introducing this new metric has been that often using the traditional levelized cost of electricity, it has clearly some shortcomings. It doesn't really take into account the value of the electricity. It only looks at the cost of the technology in terms of capex, in terms of operating costs, in terms of fuel costs, but doesn't take into account the value of the electricity being produced at a certain amount, at a certain point in time. So what we um, tried here is to um, take into account not only the cost, but also adjust the cost by the value of the electricity being generated. Um, so it's, for example, in terms of or the three components that we analyzed were the, were the energy, the capacity, and the flexibility value. So the energy value is then uh, measured using the wholesale electricity price. The capacity uh, value takes into account the um, the to which extent a technology can provide, uh, let's say, firm capacity during peak time. And the flexibility value takes into account um, the flexibility of a technology to provide uh, flexibility um, to the system. So that's kind of new metric that we um, try to introduce to um, then um, just in terms of our scenario results. So these flexibility and um, capacity value are based on information we also take from our depending on the context of the of the of the of the region uh, in the, uh, so the 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 context of the of the scenario or the context of the electricity system. So that way, taking into account um, the results we get from our scenarios and introducing it or using it for this new value adjusted LCE, we we try to better describe or assess the um, competitiveness of different electricity technologies, which is shown on the on the right side for the case of China for different power technologies. Um, another area on the on the next slide um, is not only the or one challenge is not only the temporal resolution in long term models, but also the, the spatial aspect, particularly if you look at if we because we are running global models, that's always sort of a kind of challenge. How do we uh, better reflect um, the uh, spatial differences uh, within our model regions. So one approach clearly, again, is one could increase the resolution, um, spatial resolution of the model by introducing more regions, um, or introducing more more points uh, in in the model. Uh, we've chosen um, a kind of different approach, what is illustrated here, that, for example, uh, for describing the um, onshore wind potential, uh, we used, uh, used uh, some spatial analysis to approximate uh, the distance and that way the transmission costs 
um, to bring these wind resources to the consumers, and the consumers have been approximated here by the by cities. Um, so that way, we uh, tried to characterize uh, further renewable potentials um, in terms of yeah distance to city to get a proxy transmission cost, but also then uh, differentiating the potential even further by different city size categories to take into account uh, not only the distance uh, but also the quantity of the electricity that could be uh, provided uh, or, that, or that is demanded um, in different parts within the model region. So that's one pr kind of approach we've chosen to characterize renewable potentials in our models. Um, and this illustrates also the importance of, of data for modeling. Um, I mean, through digitization, more data are becoming available. Um, but it's also clear that besides um, the methodology of models, also tools are needed um, to basically turn data um, into useful insights and information. The next slide, please. Um, so the um, last topic I briefly want to touch upon is um, capacity building uh, for energy modeling. Uh, and long-term scenarios, uh, we are conducting regularly modeling training um, as part of our Energy Training Week and also Energy Efficiency Training Week, as well as um, dedicated collaboration with countries on model training and development. And I just want to stress um, two points here in that context. Um, first, um, I think there's not only a need uh, to train analysts in developing models and scenarios, but also to increase knowledge among potential users, meaning uh, governments or industries, in the use and interpretation of, um, of scenarios. Um, so that um, the users of these uh, scenarios are also uh, being aware of the strengths and limitations of different modeling approaches. Uh, for example, I mean, one uh, very simple uh, kind of uh, message here is that, I mean, a single model cannot answer all questions. So it's really each model has its strengths and limitations, and the choice of model in the end depends on the questions that we want to answer. Um, second point I just want to make is that an investment not only in terms of models and modeling teams, but also in improving data and statistics um, for the energy sector in a country or region. Um, so it's not only about modeling, but also improving data and statistics. Um, on the positive side, at the same time, energy scenarios can then be also a platform of opportunity to engage with stakeholders uh, much better to discuss and define future energy pathways um, for a country. Um, the next slide, please. Um, finally, I would like to mention a relative new undertaking at the IEA, that's the Clean Energy Transition Program, or short CDP. It was launched um, at the end of 2017 by our uh, member countries with a purpose to support countries in, the clean and in their clean energy transitions. Um, there are several work areas um, in this program, as you see in this, uh, in this bottom uh, graph. Um, so it also includes uh, dedicated uh, work areas to policy advice and modeling for for countries, particularly if you look at the countries, we're really focusing on emerging developing countries. Uh, part of them are our Asian countries, but also um, other regions um, in the world. And also includes uh, um, uh, work areas dedicated to training capacity building. So it's one of the approaches that we want to help countries in developing strategies for the for clean energy uh, pathways. Um, so to um, summarize, um, our presentation on the next slide. Um, in terms of the use of long-term scenarios, um, global scenarios do not only address global challenges, um, as mentioned, as mentioned, climate change or sustainable development goals, but can also help to draw the attention of national stakeholders to important questions, um, and that way triggering similarities in the national context. For example, in terms of cooling or developing roadmaps um, in the national context. Um, scenarios are also important, um, but not the sole um, component in the decision-making process. I guess I want to keep in mind that there are further analysis uh, be necessary to complement um, the scenario modeling work. That could be what you mentioned or shown you earlier. Uh, could be road mapping or also tracking progress to uh, to being able also to adjust policies as um, as one moves on along the trans uh, clean energy um, pathway. In terms of the model development and improving scenarios, um, I would like to say that model and scenario development um, goes hand in hand with improving data and statistics, which so is the point I just mentioned before. And um, long-term models and scenarios often already take an integrated view of the energy systems and its interlinkages. Um, so that's already something I guess uh, many 
people that are involved in long-term energy system modeling are aware of, um, but they also face new challenges um, such as higher temporal and spatial resolution in the context of the integration of uh, renewables or to look at the consumer beha behavior in the context of digitalization. And that means that potentially um, not a single model can answer all questions, but uh, one rather reads the toolbox of different models or tools um, to address um, these new questions that are appearing on the horizon if one really wants to uh, or take the transition to a clean energy um, system uh, seriously. Um, the last um, area in terms of capacity building and uh, for, model, uh, for modeling and scenario development, um, yeah, as I mentioned already before, model development is a long-term process and it uh, requires investment in, in terms of particular not only in software or tools but also in terms of people. Um, so continuity um, is, from our experience, really important when uh, when building up uh, modeling teams, whether it's in a government or whether it's in a research center or university. And um, the final point I would like to make is, yeah, that uh, it's, when we talk about modeling, it's only about the results of the scenarios themselves, but I guess also the approach that developing a scenario can be a valuable exercise on its own, having the potential of bringing together different stakeholders um, to discuss future strategies for the energy sector and also understanding the energy sector today in, in a country. Better. Um, so that's all I basically want to start to say. If we just uh, move to the next slide, I would just would like to just, would like only to mention that the IE has a pleasure to host next year the International Energy Workshop. That's a long-standing international conference on energy modeling, bringing together modelers from around the world. And if you're interested um, in or want to learn more about energy modeling and scenario, actually that's the place to go next year. So thank you very much for your attention. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Uwe and Stephanie. Um, I thought that was very interesting and very clear and informative. Thank you for that. So now is an opportunity for people on the webinar to ask a, a couple of questions. We have maximum of five minutes to do that, so we'll have to move relatively quickly. I've got a couple of questions up on the screen here, but uh, there's time to post a, a couple more if anybody wishes to. So uh, Uwe and Stephanie, whoever wants to take this, two quick questions for you, and if you keep your answers relatively quick, that'd be great. Um, so I won't name names, but um, first question, have you considered carbon taxes and costs in the value-adjusted levelized cost of energy? And if so, at what level? Uh, yeah, I mean, these are already, I mean, on the, if we uh, talk, I mean, the, the new thing about the um, uh, value-adjusted LCE is um, we took the kind of traditional cost components like like capacity investment costs, operating costs, fuel costs, and also um, carbon taxes, and then included um, the value of the electricity being produced or the capacity, what's the value of the capacity for the for the energy system or the flexibility of the technology. Um, so yeah, carbon taxes are already um, included in the kind of traditional LCE approach um, for when we, uh, in our metrics, um, in terms of um, CO2 uh, taxes or CO2 prices that we see in our scenarios, um, it goes um, if I, uh, it goes up in, the, for example, in our um, two-degree scenario, it reaches around um, $250 per ton of CO2 in 2060. Um, in our sustainable development scenario, if I recall correctly, it's um, a range around um, 100, uh, 100, 10 to 120 dollars per ton of CO2. But again, I mean, this carbon, this carbon tax or carbon price is not just, uh, I mean, it shouldn't be implemented if we implement a carbon price um, everywhere. It's more like a indicator about the marginal abatement cost or avoidance cost that are needed in different uh, parts of the energy system um, to reach or trigger reductions. It could also be implemented in the terms of two, uh, standards for energy efficiency or, um, or standards in terms of, let's say, C2 density of electricity generation. So it's more um, kind of um, cost measure to compare different uh, mitigation options. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so one more question at the moment. So this is on the subject of openness, and one uh, somebody on the line makes the point that uh, uh, open access and open data is important for interfacing with the public and researchers. Uh, comments that uh, some IRIN, uh, some IEA publications are embargoed or behind paywalls. Um, asking about the possibility of adding suitable Creative common licenses to reports and data sets to make the information more widely accessible. Any insights into that or any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we're also discussing um, 
internally how we can better communicate and also share our our work with um, with the with the wider world. Um, so we're much more um, we're moving also to um, to making a large part of our publications available for free. Um, also, um, parts of our um, uh, of the um, of the um, scenario results, for example, of ETP, but also the World Energy Outlook are available on our website. Um, so it's also something we are continuously um, discussing internally uh, how we can uh, move forward uh, to um, to make much more of our work um, directly available on our website. Okay, thank you for that. Well, we've reached the half hour mark and I'm anxious to ensure that our Chilean colleagues have enough time. So uh, no more time for any questions, but I'm sure we can follow up uh, by email if people wish. Thank you very much for that, Uwe and Stephanie. Very interesting. So now let's move on to the second of our group of pre presenters. So from the Chilean government and the independent service operator. So I think Javier Bustos, I think you're leading off on this and then uh, Juan Carlos will, will follow up, I believe. So slides just up on the screen, I'll hand over to you, Javier. Thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna try to do it uh, short and have the opportunity for questions and also have the opportunity that uh, Juan Carlos from the ISO in Chile uh, also can explain the perspective of the ISO in this long-term energy planning in Chile. Just uh, as a brief context, just to mention that Chile uh, has around 23 gigawatts of capacity installed. Um, generation is basically still based on coal, and um, uh, yes, 40 percent of our generation mix, and but the renewal is growing each year and right now it's around 40 percent when we consider um, hydropower just based on run of river or reserve generation when we start working on scenarios and um, energy uh, scenarios and um, we have to talk about our current regulation that is the electric transmission regulation. That includes uh, two components that are the ones that are gonna be described today. One is the long-term energy planning that is uh, performed by the energy ministry and has an horizon of 30 years. It has to be done every five years and the goal of this long-term energy planning is to present different scenarios for the transmission expansion. That's why the National Commission of Energy took these scenarios and uh, performs the transmission planning with a horizon of 20 years every year. The long-term energy planning uh, is a process that uh, by law has to include projections of, uh, of demand and supply uh, of energy considering at least six uh, key issues. One is um, generation areas or poles based on renewable uh, energies, uh, distributed generation, any kind of energy exchanges that we can have with our neighbors, uh, uh, international exchanges. Also, uh, environmental policies that could be relevant for the long-term energy scenarios, goals that the country have of energy efficiency, and finally, since we have different regions in our country, uh, which strategic energy plans these regions have. At least these are the six issues that the uh, electricity regulation established that we have to consider to do energy planning. But the way we do it is through a participatory process where uh, to design these energy scenarios, we first have all the data that we can collect uh, in terms of the national energy balance, uh, projections of uh, cost of different sources of energy, um, projection of the demand. And with all this import data, what we do is form a expert committee that uh, through a process that was designed with the help of the um, IDB, 
um, discuss and finally uh, have a set of scenarios that can be modeled and uh, a simulation of the future uh, that could happen in the country. Uh, through these energy scenarios, we have uh, a projection on supply, demand, and some complementary analysis regarding how resilient, for example, these energy scenarios can be. The, those, finally, are the ones that the National Commission of Energy has to uh, take into consideration for the transmission expansion, but also this National Commission of Energy has to consider what the ISO or the electrical coordinator um, recommends to do. Uh, Juan Carlos will present more detail on this later. How we take all this data, all this uh, participation process, and became these discussions into energy scenarios, well, this procedure first starts trying to identify the main variables that can have a high impact in the future, and also variables that are very uncertain. Uh, for example, the price of uh, fossil fuels, typically one variable that is very uncertain and can have a high impact. Then, after these variables are determined in this expert committee, uh, we, as the Energy Ministry, have projections on these variables, uh, discuss with the experts about uh, if these projections are good enough, it has to be corrected, it has to be complement in some way. And finally, with this set of variables, we discuss with the experts uh, a believable story about how these variables are consistent with an, within an energy scenario. For example, if we mention that we are going to have uh, an increasing amount of uh, green taxes, that could, has to be in, in a scenario where the uh, um, generation of fossil fuels is diminishing. So the scenario has to be consistent by itself. We cannot have variables with projections that are not consistent between each other. Once we have these energy scenarios uh, classified, we model them. For that, we, uh, for example, for the demand projection, we use econometric simulations based on LEAP. Um, particularly, for example, in terms of the consumption of transport sector or, for example, uh, the consumption of the mining sector that is very important in Chile. Once we have the demand projection on energy and electricity in particular, we took the electricity demand uh, forecast and we use a local model. The model we use is called PET in, in Chile. It has been developed for the electrical system of Chile. And we optimize generation and transmission without including short-term constraints. That's an issue in our current uh, procedure that we cannot include, or at least the tools we have right now cannot include these short-term constraints. The electric expansion model doesn't give the amount of flexibility, for example, that we are going to need as a country in the future. Um, so that's a restriction of, of this kind of, of, of exercises. But we are trying to improve, for example, some uh, uh, issues that are, could be really relevant in the future, like distributed generation. And for that, we use also econometric, econometric estimation uh, that is focused on the residential sector. These are the five scenarios that we, for example, had in the last energy planning process that, that ended in March this year. And you have there the variables or the factors that are, have a high impact in the future in Chile, but also are uncertain about the results. For example, the, how are, is the citizens, the citizens or the social uh, disposition for more infrastructure, for more projects in the energy sector, of course, the second variable is the energy demand, how it's going to be the technological change in terms of battery storage, the, the effect of uh, the environmental externality costs, how are going to be uh, internalized in terms, for example, of green taxes. 
the investment cost of non-conventional renewable energies, and, final, and finally, uh, fuel price. All these factors create these five scenarios with different combinations of high, low uh, levels, and as I mentioned below, before, trying to tell a consistent story for each scenario. None of these scenarios are uh, preferred in terms of political uh, decisions or political or, or, poly, or of energy policy. All these scenarios were created without considering probabilities. The results of the, for example, just to give you a brief of the results of the last process, took into consideration that at least by 2050 we're going to have 40% of electric vehicles and 100% of um, public transportation in terms of buses uh, based off, uh, on an electric vehicle. Also, that we're going to have at least 100 and, uh, 150,000 households with distributed generation based on solar rooftops. Uh, and at least by 2030, we're going to reach 60% of renewable generation in all the scenarios. And even in a couple of the scenarios considered by 2045, we're going to have 90%, almost 90% of generation based on renewables. Not only non-conventional renewables, here we are including hydropower in any scale. Also, in a couple of scenarios, we discovered that we're going to have to upgrade or increase the capacity of our LNG uh, terminals, uh, where we import LNG and we uh, have these three gasification terminals. And finally, also, we included interconnections with our neighbors, with Peru and with Argentina, uh, basically to export electricity during solar power hours, but importing in the night uh, to complement uh, this generation. The main achievements of our first process of this first long-term energy process planning was to have a participatory process, a process that was validated finally by the energy sector. Um, also, it was important to include for the first time in Chile projections of uh, electric vehicles, of electric heating, and distributed generation. And also, in some way, these results and the inputs that we finally use have become a, a valid source of information, not only for other processes like the ones that the ISO uh, Conducts, but also what were the private companies also um, take. We need to improve, of course, for next processes. It was very interesting to know what the uh, the IEA was considering in terms of the challenges that we face in the sector because we face basically the same challenges. Uh, in terms of scenarios, we need a, perhaps a better representation of uncertainty on how this is, is considered in the representative scenarios. But in terms of models, we need to address the issue of uh, including transmission as an optimization process uh, with generation. Uh, we need to improve that in our process. We need to include the short-term constraints in our uh, expansion. And of course, we, continue, we need to continue improving our projections on demand uh, on our demand model. In that term, the, the ISO has a pretty interest, interesting experience that we want to replicate. On energy supply, uh, that's a continuous work with the National Commission of Energy. The National Commission of Energy in Chile is the regulator. We, as the energy ministry, um, work side by side with them in terms of have a better uh, process. So the coordination with the public sector, I think, is, is, is a key issue that is worth mentioning. Uh, as I mentioned before, the long and short-term analysis is something that we know is a challenge for the whole sector, and it's going to take perhaps uh, a few years to have a methodology or perhaps a software that we can implement uh, in a confident way. Finally, as a complementary analysis, uh, we need to, to progress in terms of how to include analysis on terms of the, how resilient these scenarios are. Um, there is a work in Chile that has been recently uh, done with the universities of Chile and the universities of Manchester 
uh, that is progressing in that direction that is very useful. And we've been uh, not only climate change, but other issues have to be included in terms uh, of designing better and more resilient scenarios. Distributed generation is a key issue in Chile. Chile has a huge potential in terms of solar power. So solar rooftop is just one dimension we just included. We need to have a better um, understanding of how distributed generation, not only at small scale, but medium scale, can replace perhaps centralized generation and transmission expansions or in, 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 in the country. And finally, we, have, we need to, to have a better description of the energy demand profile in terms of the hours that are going to need, be needed, the demand and the consumption of energy. Um, this is particularly important in terms of how is the demand for flexibility in our uh, energy system. This is perhaps a brief description, but this is the main topics of our uh, long-term energy scenario experience. And now I think it's a good idea to continue with uh, Juan Carlos. Well, uh, now uh, I am going to present how we have applied all the uh, long-term energy scenarios that Javier explained and the annual process that was uh, uh, approved two years ago and we are using in an annual uh, vision in order to uh, finally uh, send a proposal by the uh, Independent System Coordinator to the National Energy Commission uh, in terms of the projects to be developed from the year after the, the present, uh, requires the uh, long-term energy planning process that was uh, presented by Javier. With these uh, different uh, scenarios, we have to uh, perform all the uh, transmission planning studies and the, this is the starting point of the process. There are different stages of uh, analysis with the interaction with the market agents uh, who can present their own projects for the analysis of the National Energy Commission. And uh, finally, uh, with the possibility of some discrepancies in front of an expert panel. That is a, a very good way to solve uh, some differences among the different agents. And uh, uh, annually, the process takes around one year and a half. It starts with the proposal of the uh, coordinator in January, and it is finishing on the year after, uh, around May, or uh, with the uh, enactment of a decree with the projects to be tendered internationally, according to the uh, Chilean rules for the delivery of transmission projects by the same uh, independent system operator. Uh, some of the main criteria that were created by the uh, law in 2016 uh, consider uh, those in terms of uh, uh, meeting the adequacy, the security of service, uh, that are the traditional way to plan the transmission system, but including resilience, that was mentioned by Javier. Uh, and this is very important because this is the capacity to resist low probability and high impact events. And some of those are very um, typical in Chile because of uh, uh, hydrological uh, continuous uh, drought periods, uh, some uh, flows, some fires that uh, in reality has been uh, more probable than the traditional low probability uh, because of the uh, climate change. Uh, also, the law considers the uh, open access to the grid in terms of uh, delivering competition for the different agents in the market in order to reduce prices uh, for the final consumers, the sustainability in terms of an efficient use of the territory and the use of the existing assets, and finally, the robustness 
uh, meaning a long-term vision in the developing of the transmission solution and the introduction of uh, flexibility. Uh, particularly in terms of flexibility associated to the variable renewable energy, uh, we have been dealing and uh, developing our transmission studies, uh, specifically considering the length of Chile, that's very particular to compare to other countries in the world, we are very long and narrow, 3,100 kilometers from the north to the south, and it means the size and the location of reserves is very important. How we forecast hydro, solar, and wind is another important issue, particularly in our uh, scenarios. Uh, for example, for hydro, in terms of considering those issues of uh, climate change that has been uh, meaning a uh, dry uh, seasons uh, continuously, for example, for the last eight years, and the, the impact of uh, inertia constraint and new technologies like a uh, battery energy storage system. We have 52, 52 megawatts installed in Chile in three different areas, but for the future they uh, are very important. The same with uh, flexible AC transmission and HVDC uh, system uh, in order to interconnect a long distance renewable uh, potential located in the north of Chile to the center. And also smart grid. Uh, the stages of uh, transmission planning uh, start with a process where we co optimize generation and transmission uh, investment considering the operational cost uh, in a multi node with a multi node representation, uh, an analysis specifically of the uh, short term constraints to be included in a one node model, but uh, it is very important to uh, check uh, the options of flexibility and to take into account in a more detailed model in the stage three, where we uh, evaluate uh, what's the uh, impact in terms of uh, uh, constraints in the future for the next 20 years in the different sections of the transmission system. And uh, it is the main driver to uh, analyze uh, transmission projects to uh, economic, uh, able, to economically evaluate them, and on stage four, finally, to recommend an optimal uh, transmission plan, and with a lot of learnings about the resources to provide flexibility. Uh, of course, the use of uh, optimization is uh, very important as a locational signal in terms of planning, uh, because the uh, way the uh, a transmission tariff will be passed to the final consumers is uh, via a postal stamp. Uh, I have to add that uh, Chile has been maintaining for almost 30 years a locational marginal pricing in the short term. So this is a locational signal that is present in the in the short term uh, in the operation of the transmission system. This is uh, uh, the scenarios. Uh, we used in the last uh, transmission uh, planning proposal this year uh, to the National Energy Commission uh, showing how we uh, use the data uh, that are coming from the uh, long-term energy planning from the ministry and uh, departing from the referential costs and with some uh, uh, different uh, scenarios in order to stress different conditions we look at more uh, probable in terms of defining location of power plants and its impact on the transmission system. Uh, these are the results uh, for the three scenarios. Uh, with colors are showed uh, projects located in the north, in the uh, closer north, centre and in the south of Chile. Uh, and uh, it means the results uh, of uh, installed capacity of new generation, uh, mostly or I could say 100% renewable variable energy, uh, solar, wind, and, and other, that are the input for the uh, transmission expansion. And uh, finally, the main results we have here uh, in a very summarized way, because uh, the, the process uh, covers the main transmission, the zonal transmission, uh, and the, in that way, uh, you can see that uh, in colors are the different voltage levels, uh, mainly 154, that it's uh, today present in 2018, but disappearing by 2025. 
a, a very long and uh, a complete 220 kV system and uh, a day by day stronger 500 kV grid uh, that's in 2018 uh, covers the main areas of Chile but in the future will be the main backbone of the system and in 2030 uh, we are uh, waiting for the uh, evaluation that we proposed this year of an AVDC project uh, that will interconnect in the north of Chile to the center around 1,500 kilometers uh, with uh, the first one HVDC line that is uh, interconnected uh, with the uh, AC system in order to uh, provide a good way, efficient way to uh, bring all the renewable variable energy from the north to the south. That's my presentation. Thank you very much, Juan Carlos, um, and thank you to Javier as well. Um, both presentations were extremely clear and very informative and interesting. Thank you. So again, we have just a couple of minutes for questions. Um, so do post them on the group. Um, and let me just have a look here and see what we've got coming in. So I've got a couple of questions here and we only have five minutes or so to cover them. Um, so let's see how we go. So Javier or Juan Carlos, you can decide between you which of you responds to these. So the first one is, can you say to what degree of absolute decarbonization is achieved under each long-term scenario? either as a reduction in the emission rate by the end of the year or cumulative emissions across the scenario period. I wonder if that's quite a detailed question that might be difficult for you to answer, but uh, Javier, do you want to give that a go? The degree of absolute decarbonization achieved under each scenario. Well, in Chile has an, an, an NDC of the reduction of 30% of intensity in emissions by 2030, at least 30%. In all the scenarios we simulate, we reach that goal in the energy sector. The, what you have to consider is that 70% of uh, emissions in Chile comes from the energy sector. So we, here we haven't included the other 30% of other sectors. Um, in terms of total emissions, um, we, uh, it is important to, to consider that uh, when we included this constraint of the NDC in our, our scenarios, we didn't include it the, uh, the current process of uh, decommissioning of coal plants, that is an agreement between the government and the companies to start uh, the decommissioning or conversion of the plants in the uh, following years. So uh, the energy planning in some way has to be updated to include that. And of course, we're going to have a higher range of decarbonization. But so far, the, um, the, the NDC by 2030 would be in good way to be accomplished, uh, at least from the energy sector. Thank you for that. That's, uh, I hope answers the question of the person on the line. It was very clear to me. Um, a somewhat related question, which I also fear may be a bit too detailed for the call, but let's again see if you can give us a uh, less than one minute answer. Uh, can you give us more details on how the main variables of the scenarios uh, constructed are defined? So, how are, how are the main variables of the scenarios defined? Can you give a little bit more detail on that? Well, the main variables that were included in long-term energy scenarios were defined by this expert committee. What we did was invited around 20 people from different parts of the energy and non-energy sector that were related with what could happen in the future in Chile in the next 30 years. And with them, what we do was give them uh, the typical list of variables that you include in, uh, in, in a model, prices, uh, demand, but also discuss with them what other variables could be considered that would have a high impact. We even uh, do a, um, a quantitative, quantitative or more graphical analysis 
of high impact and high uncertainty on uh, the energy sector. And uh, after that analysis, with all this committee, we agree on which one were the most important ones and could be different in different scenarios. For example, I just would mention that hydrology depends on climate change, it, but for, it wasn't included as one, one of the main variables because for all the experts, the future seems uh, more dry. Uh, so that's the way it was included. Okay, thank you, Javier. That's very good and brings us uh, exactly in on time. So my apologies, no time for any more questions at this point. Uh, but uh, thank you to all of our speakers. I hope that I certainly found that very informative. I hope you all did too. So just a reminder that uh, the next one of these uh, webinars will be held on the same day, this time next week. Um, it will be in the morning, Central European time, uh, 9.30 a.m. Central European time, 8.30 a.m. Universal time. Um, and there we will have two speakers. Carrie Sandholt from the China National Renewable Energy Center and Niels Bisgaard from the Danish Energy Agency. So do join us again to hear from those two speakers. Thank you again to everybody and we look forward to speaking to you again in the future. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.